pleasant good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the Center for Biosecurity Studies at the University of the West Indies Kefield campus. And today we are meeting to launch our fourth Invisible Border Initiative. Um, and we will have an amazing lineup of uh, presenters from all over the globe, from India to Vanuatu, which is in the Pacific Ocean, and even right here at CERMES at the UWI KFL campus. And so um, we will begin. Um, we will have a set of two polls that we will ask the audience to um, fill out their information so that this will help us in our future um, webinar event to help meet your needs as it relates to our outreach and our education um, thrust here at the center. So without any further ado, um, I will begin my presentation as we introduce the fourth invisible border initiative. And as we would know, the COVID-19 pandemic has really transformed life as we know it from the wearing of masks to sanitizing, to uh, isolation and quarantine, but also to in terms of digitization and digitalization and how we can better implement information technology into our everyday lives to make our lives easier and also to solve problems. And this is really at the core of the CBS Fourth Invisible Border Initiative. So to give you some brief background on the center, we were established in 2019 um, at the UWI KFL campus, and we seek to support regional governments and societies in the Caribbean to tackle a litany of biosecurity vulnerabilities that threaten our biological ecosystems, which impact on health, environment, and also climate. So we have six major pillars on which CBS conducts its work, namely advocacy and outreach, of which this is a major part, webinars such as this, education and training in terms of the programs and courses that we offer, also in research and consultancy, policy, entrepreneurship, and program development. And we have identified three main focal areas. The first of which is border security and trade. And this particular initiative is focused in this particular focal area. Um, also climate change and its impact because of the nature of Caribbean islands and Caribbean states and the vulnerability to climate change. And also finally, the maritime issues and the blue economy. So very briefly, I will explain um, as best as I can what biosecurity means to CBS. Um, because we know the general perception of biosecurity is one rooted in infectious diseases, the prevention of pests and pathogens across borders. However, within the context of the Caribbean, we recognize that biosecurity has to be re-examined in terms of the scope, in terms of how we develop the necessary tools and solutions. So we went back to the rudimentary analysis. We looked at the word bio and security. And when you look at the prefix bio, it is derived from the Greek word bios, which means one life. And security, which is der derived from the Latin word securus, which means freedom from, from anxiety or freedom from care. And when you put both together, you get one life with freedom from anxiety or freedom from care. And this is how we contextualize biosecurity. And from that, we've developed our definition of what biosecurity is. And we've defined it as the science and practice of safeguarding lives and livelihoods. And this is done through the systematic reduction of vulnerabilities to biological ecosystems. And within the Caribbean, there are many major threats to lives and livelihoods in the Caribbean, human trafficking included, cybercrime, narco trafficking, there are several social drivers, and of course, natural disasters. 
So we've developed an analytical tool that we like to call our biosecurity lens. And this particular tool is called PEST HEAL, and it's an acronym for the political, the economic, social, technological, health, which involves animal, plant, and also human health, the environment, ethics, and the legal component. Because what we recognize with respect to biosecurity, we are about connecting the dots. So in order to develop comprehensive solutions that are targeted to these um, really uh, burdensome problems, we have to take a very close look at several facets and several factors. And we believe that this type of tool allows you to drive multidisciplinarity in terms of developing those solutions. Um, so that being said, here is a recent article um, on cyber biosecurity and how it can be used to help safeguard the bioeconomy. And the term cyber biosecurity is defined as an emerging hybridized discipline at the interface of cybersecurity, cyber physical security, and biosecurity. And it involves the use of several information technological tools, such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and blockchain technology, and several other innovative technological tools. And artificial intelligence is defined as a simulation of human intelligence processes by machines, in particularly computer systems. And machine learning is defined as a study of computer algorithms that can improve automatically through experience and by the use of data. And we will get to see all of these particular technologies in action in a very applied setting to be able to make life easier and to make all of us safer. So now about the initiative, the Caribbean Fourth Invisible Border Initiative, as I said, it seeks to support government, Caribbean governments in minimizing threats and risks to cybersecurity, data protection, cloud storage and computing, given the global shift to digitalization and also cryptocurrencies. It also employs the use of new technologies such as artificial intelligence, remote sensing, smart cities, the, the internet of things or IoT, uh, cloud computing, blockchain and machine learning to tackle a host of biosecurity challenges such as wildlife crimes, natural disasters, infectious disease outbreaks, um, also climate change threats to lives and livelihoods. And so we have a number of different goals and objectives, and these would be to maximize the potential of these tools in combating biosecurity threats within the Caribbean. We're also looking to protect this fourth invisible border, because as we know, there are other, three other borders which are visible, which is land, sea, and air, but the cyber border has emerged as the fourth border that countries have to deal with. And of course, we are looking to develop our education and training programs and establish CBS as a regional hub, as the, at the interface of cybersecurity and also biosecurity within the Caribbean. And these are some of the um, challenges that we will aim to solve using this particular type of technology, climate change and its impact, obviously, um, liquid and solid waste management crisis, rampant biodiversity decline, and several other key official, um, sorry, key uh, problems within the Caribbean. And there are some national initiative, national policies to bear in mind, the Barbados Data Protection Act, which was only recently enacted at the beginning of this year uh, and became active from the 31st of March, and also the Computer Misuse Act, which is here in the Carib uh, in Barbados. And this is the AAA alignment as it relates to the UWI and where the focal area primarily for this initiative um, lies within border security and trade. So we get to 
some components of this initiative. And the first one is the Climate Infectious Nexus. And this is a proposal of research where we look at the interface of climate change and infectious diseases within the Caribbean. And we have a number of different partners who we are aiming to collaborate with. We've started already with CERMES and you will hear more as the time goes by with Dr. Payne and also CBS and what we embarked on in terms of how are we going to use modeling, mathematical modeling and predictive modeling to be able to uh, predict outbreaks and also um, diseases within the Caribbean so that public health officials can plan in a more strategic manner. And there are several other um, collaborators here, as you can see. And so we are really looking forward to getting this off the ground and getting some publications uh, off as well so that we can raise the level of awareness to this type of research activity within the Caribbean. There's also the disaster risk impact proposal where we're looking at risk management because as we who live in the Caribbean are quite well aware, every year we are battling with the impacts of climate change, whether they be severe weather systems such as hurricanes and tropical storms, or whether this may be an earthquake or volcanic eruption, all of these are um, possibilities within the Caribbean. And so we want to utilize this type of disaster risk modeling to be able to generate rapid cost estimate, also to identify areas of high risk and vulnerability where you can then strategically employ the limited available resources for maximum impact within the Caribbean. And finally, as you will hear from Jose, he will look at the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and several other internet, sorry, information technological tools in tackling wildlife crime. And at the center, we've started to develop the Caribbean Wildlife Crime Database where we're utilizing um, information technology and digitalization to seamlessly integrate all the different players and stakeholders as it relates to the chain of illegal wildlife trade and also wildlife crime um, as it relates to environmental crime as well uh, within the Caribbean. So the final part of the initiative that we'll be seeking to strengthen is the Caribbean cybersecurity legislation from around the um, Caribbean. As we would know, the cyber governance is an emerging field and therefore some countries are more advanced than others. But in order to safeguard the Caribbean, we will need to have a extended thrust in terms of closing the gaps where cybersecurity is concerned. And finally, we will have our CBS newsletter, which will be issued um, uh, Sometime during this semester, so before the end of the semester, we will release and disseminate our CBS newsletter. And we invite those who may have contributions to the newsletter. It's open to all and sundry to submit articles relevant to the focal areas that we have just identified, climate change and its impacts, border security and trade and maritime issues and the blue economy. You can send them to biosecurity at kfil.uwi.edu, and we would welcome those articles. And finally, we have three professional short courses, which we will launch. Two of them will be launched in February, 2022. One is the general biosecurity course. It's called Biosecurity, More Than Meets the Eye. And we utilize enterprise uh, and enterprise risk management approach, where we will delve into the meat of the matter as it relates to biosecurity. But at the interface of each individual's professional life. So if you're a, a working for a utility company, if you're working for a, a banking institution, we believe that using the biosecurity approaches will definitely redound to the benefit of your enterprise. And we also have Living a Wildlife Part 1. And this targets illegal wildlife trade, money laundering, and border security. This will be a very exciting course. And we are supported ably here by the UNODC, 
also CITES and several other partners uh, for this particular course. And we have two uh, facilitators, namely Mr. Andrew Dalip Jr. He is an AML, an anti-money laundering specialist from Trinidad, and he will be a course facilitator. And we also have Mr. Mitch Rollins as well as a coordinator. And he's also an AML specialist, um, both in the banking and also in the actual law enforcement. He has experience in that as well. So it should be rather interesting. Um, Living of Wildlife Part 2, this will look at wildlife, pandemics, tourism, and One Health. And this will be offered next year, well, the next academic year in September 2022. Now, those housekeeping matters aside, we will now get to the presenters, what you have all been waiting for. And I start with Dr. Payne. And Dr. Payne is currently uh, a lecturer and a program co coordinator at the Center for Resource Management and Environmental Studies or CIRMES here at the UWI um, CAFO campus. Um, Dr. Payne has a BSc in Mathematics and Physics, which he obtained in 2002 from the University of the West Indies Cape Hill. He then went on to um, receive his Master's of Philosophy or MPhil in Physics from the UWI Cape Hill campus in 2006. Then he did a Master's in Engineering, Civil Engineering and Water Resource as his specialty in um, 2008. And finally, he obtained his PhD in civil engineering with a water resource specialty from the University of South Florida in 2018. So his research expertise is in hydrological modeling, environmental data science, environmental sensing, simulation of hydrological and biogeochemical processes in groundwater systems application of artificial intelligence and machine learning to simulation and optimization problems for sustainable development in natural and engineered environmental system, and also the utilization of low-cost sensor networks for environmental monitoring. And he has an extensive uh, resume in terms of experience. He's been a consultant on many different projects within the Caribbean, from Belize, to Grenada, to Dominica, um, even here in Barbados as well, where he developed a groundwater modeling um, program for the Barbados Water Authority. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Payne. Could you turn on your video and your mic? And the floor is yours. Hi, uh, good afternoon, Dr. Douglas, uh, fellow panelists, good night to you, and a warm welcome to the participants. Uh, and thanks, Dr. Douglas, for, for putting together a diverse uh, group of panelists, and including myself. And really what I'm going to be looking at is a, a major biosecurity issue for the Caribbean region, uh, at the nexus of climate change and water resources and infectious diseases. So I'll go ahead and start by sharing my screen. So the title of my presentation is Leveraging Artificial Intelligence for Disaster Risk Reduction in Small Island Developing States. And I'm going to be using a case study from Dominica. Uh, Dr. Douglas had input into this work from conceptualization and so on. And then a student from CIRMES to, to give credit, uh, Ms. Anselm worked on a lot of the GIS mapping. But the, 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 to contextualize this presentation, what the climate research group from UIMONA has projected for the Eastern Caribbean is a trend of 20% of average annual rainfall. And that has significant uh, impacts, for example, on water availability. Then there's going to be temperature increases on the order of 0.65 to 0.84 degrees Celsius. 
uh, more intense rainfall events and tropical storms. And over the last decade or so, we've seen the socioeconomic ramifications of extreme events. So for example, looking at data from Dominica in 2017, you could see the impact to the water and sanitation sector, disaster risk management, and the health sectors. And I, I believe that the, 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 the number in terms of the last two events, in terms of economic impact, is over 200% of GDP. So really, uh, what the implications of climate change for the water resources sector, especially given that an island like Dominica, uh, because for resilience, you really need redundancy, but in some islands like Dominica, there's only, there's only the reliance on surface water, for example, as the potable water supply. So there are lots of inherent risks, uh, but the question is what innovations can be done to mitigate these risks and also to help with adaptation measures. And I hope that I can tell a story of how artificial intelligence could be leveraged here. But I think there will continue to be, there will likely be more disruptions to water distribution systems as a result of these intense tropical storms and hurricanes. Uh, so it really says that there, there needs to be more data-driven decision-making. And unfortunately, you know, data scarcity is a problem in this part of the region, but, you know, we really need to make a more concerted effort to gather the data that we need for these types of studies. But I'll also show some non-traditional sources of data used in this study. I hope researchers and people in the private sector could use as well. But there are many cross-cutting cross issues, including water, health, the energy nexus. So when you look at the image on the, the left, it, it helps to show the vulnerability. The neon blue color is where the water distribution network overlaps with flood hazard zones. So you can see, especially in the south, if you're not familiar for, with, with the island of Dominica for geographical context, you know, the population center is in the southwest of the island. And you can see a high density there of neon blue indicating a high risk area. And then to the right, you can see the, the stars indicate the location of intakes, these, uh, this infrastructure that pumps water from the surface water source then to the distribution system. But unfortunately, many of these intakes are in areas that high, have a high landslide susceptibility. So in, in, in the legend there, you can see areas that are high, moderate, and low landslide density. So those are some of the, the, the vulnerabilities. Now, I said, given these vulnerabilities, given the inexorable nature of climate change, we really need data-driven decision-making and artificial intelligence, I see as being able to play a pivotal role in that decision-making process. Uh, so what is artificial intelligence? Dr. Douglas alluded to it earlier, but just to re reiterate, it is any technique that enables computers to mimic human intelligence. And the subsets of machine learning, of artificial intelligence include machine learning and deep learning. And the type of artificial intelligence used in this study is deep learning. And actually, you, you may not realize, but for example, Google and Facebook have, and Amazon have really used this technique and monetize this type of technique uh, with ad recommendation. So the billion dollar industry is using this type of artificial intelligence 
to look at a history of what you've clicked on, what you're interested in, and then suggest an ad that you they think you would be interested in. But now we need to go from that type of application, but how can we apply artificial intelligence into more scientific endeavors, uh, disaster risk reduction, wildlife management, disaster management, different areas, uh, even coastal understanding, coastal processes, uh, having predictive tools that you know predict the wave run up, a whole set of different predictive tools we can leverage using artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, what I'm showing here is essentially, it sounds simple, but it's quite complicated, is input to output mapping. So you have some input data, uh, you have some, some output and you're trying to learn, you're trying to learn the relationship between, between the two. So fortunately, I see several opportunities in the region. So there's relatively low cost compute power through cloud computing. Uh, you know, years ago, you needed a very expensive supercomputer. And these were only available to, let's say, US uh, national labs or government agencies. But now there's a democratization of cloud computing. And in fact, CERMES is fortunate to have just been awarded a grant from Microsoft to use their cloud computing platform, Azure, to do some of our artificial intelligence uh, research. But then the other opportunity really is the availability of open source tools like Google's TensorFlow, which were, no long, which were at one time prohibitive, uh, but now they're these open source tools. Um, the challenges though are data scarcity, uh, which is particularly pernicious in, in the Caribbean region and needs to be fixed and just a recurring theme. Uh, and then the need for more interdisciplinary skill sets, which hopefully between CERME, CBS and other, uh, you know, higher education, uh, at academic institutions throughout the region are able to incrementally improve on this challenge. But uh, the image you see on the left shows how almost exponentially AI has been applied in disaster management with most of the applications being in disaster response. Uh, so this, this presentation is also focused on disaster response. But unfortunately, there aren't many cases of it being leveraged in the region. So really the objective here of this work was to look at developing or developing a new AI tool for assisting with disaster response, particularly in Dominica. And so the target and users, the intended end users of this tool that we call UtilNet is, would be water, energy utilities, public health and disaster managers and the insurance uh, sectors. And so the rationale, I think I built before, I said that the rationale is really that during these natural disasters in juice, which will be even you know, exacerbated by climate change, you need good situational analysis, uh, understanding, but also you know, re making rapid decisions and optimal deployment of scarce resources. But unfortunately, sometimes things are done in an ad hoc manner. And hopefully this tool can be utilized to aid with that. So as I said before, uh, we use different types of data. So the type of one non-traditional type of data that isn't heavily used in, in the region is from remote sensing. So we use satellite data. Uh, and this is a product from NASA called uh, ARIA, but it, it uses radars to detect. So, so the radar takes an image before disaster, before disaster and after. So they, they did that for Dominica and they were able to infer what the damage on the ground was. 
So for example, you could see some red areas, bright red indicate where there's more de ground deformation, so infer damage, and then the yellow would be uh, less damage, and where there aren't any colored pixels, that would be areas where the, the, the tool from the satellite data wouldn't be picking up any damage. So what we did on the right was to overlap the water distribution network over this, uh, we call it a damage proxy map. And as you can see, there are some areas, especially to the southeast of this particular domain, where there's overlap between the uh, areas that have high damage and the, the, the water, water pipelines. So this, this helps us in understanding the, the risk across this particular domain. Then the other type of data we use was crowdsourced data. So this is actually people seeing some type of damage, seeing a building down, seeing a pipeline that was damaged. And so we, 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 we source this from uh, the a Clem, Clemson GIS group out of uh, Texas, and they were able to produce some uh, crowdsourced data. So then what we did was to overlap the crowdsourced data of where people said there was damage to the satellite data. And you could see, for example, uh, areas that have relatively good overlap between what was reported on the ground and what the satellite data showed. Now, the third type of data that we leverage uh, was uh, this low altitude imagery data set. And so uh, this data set has mil millions of, of images showing you know, flooding, landslides, damage, fires. And so the, the, the artificial intelligence tool is trained to infer or predict after seeing, being trained on these images, can it predict if it sees a new image, if it can classify if the image is a flooding or damage, so on and so forth. So we use this data set then for training our artificial intelligence tool. So what we did was to train it on the, that data set. Unfortunately, all of the images were not for the Caribbean region. And we used the images of damage and no damage. So the AI tool was trained on images of, you know, a whole collage of different images that have damage and no damage. Then we showed it, you know, pre-Maria, Hurricane Maria images, uh, post-Maria images, and see how well it could classify uh, these images. Uh, this is using a particular technique called a convolutional neural network. But uh, details aside, you can see that the pre-Maria image on the, the first pre-Maria image on the left, May 1st, 2017, the ground truth was no damage. The AI system predicted no damage. And then post-Maria, the ground truth was damaged. The AI system after being trained was able to predict that this was an image of damage. So combining these three data sets, the satellite data, the crowdsource data, and all of these images of damage or no damage, we we're able to synthesize it into this UtilNet, uh, this, this product I call the UtilNet priority response map for this event, Hurricane Maria event in 2017 that had significant impact on the Dominica's water resources infrastructure. And so you can see feeding the data through this, uh, this neural network, so the, the artificial intelligence, we were able to produce this product that delineates the domain into you know, four different areas. So the area in green is low, uh, low risk, the area in yellow is medium risk, and then the area in red is high risk, where 
you know, the crowdsource data is saying, yeah, we're people on the ground, we're saying yes, we're seeing lots of impacts. The satellite data is saying that, yes, you have a high density of these red pixels. And then the AI system is saying, yes, this image is showing damage. So how this could be used by utilities uh, is that they would be able to then prioritize where most of the resources could be allocated. So cons the conclusions here is that we developed this proof of concept AI solution to aid water utilities, but as I said, it could also aid with cross-cutting issues of interest to you know, biosecurity because water crises become health crises uh, and so on, and energy crises is a whole cascading effect. We leverage these alternative sources of data, but we need more data to have a more robust uh, testing for the AI solution. So for example, I could see how drones could be used to capture more uh, imagery that could be helped to train this type of AI solution. And again, thanks to the MSC student, Sophia Allison, based in Dominica, and Dr. Kurt Douglas, and then Dowasco for providing the data. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Payne, for a very riveting and exciting um, presentation. I think it encapsulates what lies in the future for the Caribbean. I think we are all excited about making life for us safer here in the Caribbean as best as we can, as we are located in the hurricane belt. And as I mentioned, all of the other um, natural disasters that we encounter from time to time here in the Caribbean. I think this type of technology definitely augurs well for governance as well, as it feeds into the decision-making process. And we will be able to supply the in the integral data and intricate data that is necessary for making those types of decisions. So um, thank you very much for sharing that with us. And now we turn our attention to Mrs. Sandra Yuantege Hart. Um, so I'll briefly introduce Mrs. Hart. She obtained her Bachelor's of Art in Anthropology in 2006 from Princeton University in New Jersey, the USA. Subsequent to that, she also studied at the Graduate Institute, IHEID in Geneva, Switzerland, and obtained a Master's of Arts in Development Studies with a focus on gender and development in 2011. And she is a co the co-founder and CEO of Emerging Impact a blockchain for social impact company with 12 years experience in the international humanitarian sector. She's a leader in blockchain innovations and solutions for humanitarian cash delivery with extensive field-based emergency response and preparedness work in West Africa, the Caribbean, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. She has also experience in management, design, and implementation in large scale cash transfer programs and food security or livelihoods relief and recovery interventions. She's an expert in multi-country regional coordination, capacity building, oversight of response units and field offices with the ability to track multiple funding and budget streams. And Mrs. Hart has an extensive resume in terms of where she's worked in the past, um, she's an expert in the European Union Blockchain Observatory and Forum in 2021. Um, she's also worked with Oxfam with blockchain innovations and cash transfer um, in the Pacific and also in the global uh, region as well. She has also won um, several awards, the European U Union Horizon uh, 2020 Prize for Blockchains for Social Goods. And she's also a World Summit Award winner. Um, this is from 2000, 
to 2021. Uh, she's also fluent in two languages, English and French, and she's also advanced in Bislama and Pidgin, which is from her island, uh, Vanuatu, and also in Creole that is spoken in Haiti. She also has um, capacity also for uh, Spanish as well. So very well-rounded, very articulate uh, person. And we will introduce to you now, Mrs. Hart, would you kindly turn on, oh, you have your video on. Could you unmute and the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much, Kirk. Uh, let me just share my screen over here. Um, here we go. Yeah, all right. So, yeah, here we go. All right, so hello, everybody. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about, you know, not only the use of blockchain in disaster response, which is, you know, what my professional career mostly has been in, um, but also on the intersections between inclusive fi finance and the evolution of products to deliver finance digitally using blockchain technology and the complexities of disaster response uh, and the delivery of assistance in particular. Um, so I'm going to start with, you know, kind of the theory and the context coming from the Pacific Islands. Uh, so why would you use blockchain for disaster response? Uh, and so coming from the sector being specialized in the delivery of payments after the impact of a natural disaster, what, what we found, you know, whether you are an NGO, a UN agency, or even a government, is that the delivery of payments are a highly effective response to natural disasters. Why? Because it gives people flexibility and choice, and it accelerates recovery and allows you to assist both the marketplace, but also the people who have been impacted at the same time. However, um, and this is where we start to gather lessons from, from island states, particularly multi-island states. Uh, this also requires financial services infrastructure that actually reaches everybody. Uh, and in the Pacific, these are very expensive to access financial services. There is very low coverage, and I believe you see the same thing in the Caribbean as soon as you get to rural, remote, and outer islands, the number of banks and ATMs go down or are completely absent. There are limited payment instruments. So for people to pay each other, you don't necessarily have the plethora of options that you have in developed countries or in urban areas. And of course, there is this massive issue of financial exclusion uh, because of identity requirements, but also because you know the more you get into these places where the infrastructure is poor, the more difficult it is for people to access those financial services. And so you end up with a major overlap between disaster impact and those who are the most acutely affected at the household level by disasters who also tend to be those who are the most economically and financially included. Uh, and so what I found in the Pacific Islands is that both these capacity barriers and these cost barriers tend to constrain the delivery of large scale payment programs in response to disasters, despite the fact that they are recurrent, they are increasing, and you know, many people don't know this, but in the case of Vanuatu, it is the world's most disaster prone country. So we have everything. We have the landslides, we have tsunamis, we have earthquakes on a monthly basis. We have seasonal cyclones. This year, we are expecting between seven to nine major storms. Um, this is a single country, 83 islands, but we don't have one, two, four, five, we have nine active volcanoes across the country. So this is really kind of the, the context that I'm speaking to you from, uh, having worked in Vanuatu to try and set up this infrastructure since 2008. Uh, and you know what I found looking at blockchain technology was that there was a real case to leverage this technology. Why? Because blockchain solutions and the way that they're being used today do seem to fit this problem particularly well, right? So if you've heard of Bitcoin, Bitcoin is not the same as blockchain. It is just one application of blockchain technology. 
but the advent of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as the money of the blockchain, uh, of the blockchain infrastructure, the same way that hard currency, cash money, uh, is also the money that greases the wheels of our economic infrastructure. So resharing and, you know, kind of getting back to the thread of what we were talking about, the ways in which blockchain is growing to be used in terms are are very well adapted to the financial use case, right? Sending and receiving pay payments transparently from peer to peer across large geographic areas is really where we see the primary uses and evolution of blockchain. And so there is a fit to this problem. We also have to acknowledge that there is something about blockchain in the sense of looking at the value of decentralized networks that are distributed globally as being applicable to the island environment. You know, in the same way that across the blockchain, you have a global interconnected network that is distributed of essentially databases and data sets that are all different, but that can be combined and connected for a common outcome. At the same level, you know, geographically in the islands, we have multi-island nations, whether it's in the Caribbean or the Pacific, that exhibit some particularities that also mimic the blockchain infrastructure itself. Distributed, very decentralized geography with every island community having its own very vibrant microeconomy. You know, and so the, what we need to start doing is to look at how do we deliver disaster assistance in a way that engages those microeconomies. We know that people transact all the time whether it be with hard currency, you know, or trading, for example, here people will pay sometimes for school fees with sweet potato or with agricultural produce, you know, and so what we need to be doing is enabling these communities that are highly exposed to disasters to leverage their own economic behaviors to be able to recover. And we need to be giving them the financial tools to do so. We also know that one of the first infrastructures to come back online after a disaster, you know, and as, as Dr. Douglas was explaining, I have seen this in multiple regions across the world, the first piece of infrastructure to come back online the most quickly tends to be the mobile network. And what we also know is typical about island geographies is that connectivity is often reaching where banks cannot. And this really gives you this case for digitizing the delivery of payments as a natural disaster response strategy. So we now know that living in island regions puts us in a situation where these natural disasters are seasonal and recurrent. You know, you could very much see this in the last presentation. We know that these disasters are increasing in severity and frequency. But we also know, and this is why I really love, you know, the data arguments and the data crunching around this, that these disasters are still relatively predictable. There are underlying and pre-existing vulnerabilities like financial and economic exclusion, like shortages of water, um, like limited access to jobs and livelihoods that underlie and then aggravate the disaster impact that comes. And of course, the way that these disasters impact us is also related to geography. So we are still able to paint a picture of what will happen when a volcano erupts, when an earthquake strikes, uh, or when a category five storm blows through. However, the way that we respond to disasters and deliver assistance is extremely inefficient. Uh, and when I say aid efficiency, I don't just mean UN agencies or NGOs, also the way that governments assist their people. Uh, we have all, I guarantee, been in the situation where we were asking, where did the money go? It seems like so much money gets mobilized. And yet globally, if you look at the statistics, 2015 to 2020, over 145 billion reported uh, funds were given to humanitarian assistance programs to respond to natural disasters. Of that money, less than 5% went to local organizations, local businesses, and by this I mean local NGOs, community and civil so society organizations, but also the organizations and businesses that drive the economies around them. 
And so if we are delivering assistance in this way, we cannot possibly hope for a result that builds resilience and accelerates recovery over time because climate change is upon us, you know, and those of us who live in the islands are truly on the front lines. Um, so where we are now is that we know that there is this evolving technology. So within blockchain, there is decentralized finance, which is essentially the digitization of financial services on the blockchain. You know, and this has reached, I don't know if we're above this right now, but over $100 billion in investment. So we know that this area exists, it's a growing area. We know that with DeFi, blockchain allows people to bank, send, save and invest their money with higher returns at lower costs. So these are the digital financial tools that we're trying to tap into. At Emerging Impact, what we've done is we've started to make a case, both in theory and in practice, for digital cash assistance. And the results that we've seen with this are extraordinary. You know, so the background of many of these pictures are the use of a blockchain-based platform to deliver assistance in Vanuatu across 13 islands. And what we've seen compared to the delivery of assistance through a bank is that the registration process to receive funds was over an hour previously. It's now shaved down to six minutes or less. Levels of satisfaction are much higher. And most importantly, in terms of cost, time, and money, we're looking at reducing the cost to deliver assistance by over 60%. And that means that more can reach that local level. Uh, right now, where we are in terms of emerging impact is that we're saying, look, blockchain plus decentralized finance gives you the capacity to deliver digital accounts and payment tools with the speed of email. We know that there is a digital divide that particularly affects these marginalized groups that who are also acutely affected by disasters. Um, but we also know connectivity is good. So this blockchain technology, decentralized finance and the applications it gives us, gives us this digital bridge that we now need to exploit. Uh, and so when I talk about this work, I'm talking about the work that Emerging Impact is doing across six countries and three regions. We've got two big tech companies that are interested in this type of work. Uh, and we have seven international NGOs, as well as three local organizations that are using these tools to respond better at less cost, but with the same level of quality that we see with big UN programs, for example. So this really brings us to a space where we are able to harness and adapt the technology to meet people where they are and to prepare families for the future. Uh, this is a case of a local merchant in Vanuatu who uh, you know, I was really feeling articulates the case for, for a disaster response. You know, so what we're trying to do here when we use these blockchain-based blockchain tools is to develop very simple to use systems that allow us to deliver quickly and remotely, even when transport is difficult, to assist transparency. Use case number two in blockchain is the ability to track and trace so that we know how these funds are being used and what post-disaster recovery looks like. And lastly, I love the fact that this is called Invisible Border, you know, initiative is to deliver borderlessly because disasters don't care. Um, when you have a cyclone or a hurricane, they will just blow through uh, and they do not know borders. So the capacity to deliver digitally and across borders is very, very important as we move forward into this post climate change world. But when we are deploying this technology, we need to be aware that not only is it new for us, you know, who are listening to this presentation, but it is also extremely new for people who lack access to a smartphone, for example. So this woman had never used a smartphone before in her life, but she knew how to sell her goods. And so this is where we begin to look at how do we build applications of the technology in and with communities so that we come up with payment applications and systems that mimic the way that people already transact and that leverage that transactional capacity and economic behavior at the microeconomic level, at the island level. And that's where you unlock recovery and resilience, is if you can deliver payments in a way that allows money to circulate more quickly within a community, then you're really accelerating that recovery pathway. Uh, and what is particularly unique about emerging markets and the islands 
is that we have these informal networks and those informal networks give us kind of a base infrastructure to operate with. Those accelerate results. Why? Because people know and trust each other. You know, and in this case, you need trust to operate in this way more then you need experts uh, that may give you a two hour presentation on blockchain and you come out not knowing how to use it. We need to flip the switch, figure out how to use it, you know, and keep the explanations of the tech secondary. We also know that there are stakeholders that are already on the front lines and that need better tools in order to deliver. Uh, and so we've now come to this question within Emerging Impact as we work with these different NGOs and institutions to deliver payments in an accelerated manner using blockchain technology, why would you only deliver payments when it is technologically possible to deliver financial inclusion? And when we know that financial inclusion is in fact the gateway to building wealth and recovery. So we've got some pictures from our different projects here. Um, this, you know, the guy on the right side is, is a fisherman. You know, he lives in a remote offshore island but he's using this technology to accept payments so that he can recover from a category five cyclone. On the left, we have actually a taxi driver who lives in a volcanic area. So that's an active volcano behind him. Same thing, the communities around the volcano use his taxi to get into town to pay for goods um, that then recirculate in the community. And in the middle, we have a project in Kenya where we have some Maasai women in very rural areas that are participating in a micro work program, again, delivering digitally and in a way that's really enriching financial and economic inclusion. Uh, and so many people ask me, but how does, how does this work? You know, how does the money get into the blockchain and how does it go out? And what Emerging Impact offers is both this context adapted approach to integrate the technology into the environment, into the economy, into the culture, but also into the programming of said NGO or government agency. And so what we offer is an integrated platform that is built for end users that may lack digital literacy by providing them with a payment card um, to local merchants and small businesses that we know are the lifeblood of these economies and need to be able to benefit from the way these payments circulate um, by providing them with smartphones and easy to use applications. And finally, for the general public, for the donors, for the NGO and the program managers, we have a platform that allows you to track and trace who is spending money where, how, and for what purpose. And that paints a picture of recovery that is in fact accelerated when you use these systems. So Emerging Impact helps organizations convert funds into stable forms of cryptocurrency so that you're able to digitize your budgets, load them up onto a platform. Emerging Impact does all of the conversions behind the scenes so that we acknowledge that not everybody is a crypto expert. Uh, we then use this platform to allow you to launch a program by which you are using your digital wallet to distribute funds with the press with the push of a button to multiple individuals at once. Uh, individuals receive funds either onto a tap and pay card or onto a phone and are then able to spend those funds within a local network of merchants. And what that allows you to do is to accelerate the velocity of money within that community so that you actually are contributing to livelihoods recovery but also so that you are creating a participatory economy where people are helping each other recover because everybody is equally affected. Uh, and finally, we have built cash out mechanisms so that merchants can use things like mobile money or their bank account to move money from their phone into their account, into cash money to use for other purposes. Uh, and lastly, you know, when a program ends and when a program is completed post-disaster, we can generate analytics on what recovery looked like so that that can inform pub public policy and further interventions. We can also reclaim funds at any time should people use less, add funds at any time. But most importantly, we can provide people with a payment product that they can continue to use once the disaster is over. And that is the financial inclusion piece. Um, so other use cases in addition to disaster response are agribusiness where payments are an issue micro work and informal work that we know is very undocumented 
uh, tends to happen in cash. People can benefit by being able to digitize this. Predictive payments. So what Carl was talking about, if we have the data on impact zones and we have the payment mechanisms, then that does allow us to develop trigger-based anticipatory mechanisms to assist people before a disaster to prepare and after a disaster to recover using exactly the same system all the way through. Um, small business, social protection, and social welfare are also areas where the delivery of mass payments is particularly problematic, especially in island regions and environments. Uh, and so in addition to this advisory integration and analysis work that Emerging Impact does, we also have built this platform that includes cards, includes phones, includes a dashboard in order to really empower fintechs and aid organizations to use this blockchain-based financial product to deliver faster, cheaper, and more easily. Uh, and so just to give you, because I always get this question, but really like, how does it work? Uh, how, these are the different features of the system that you can use to deliver in this way. Um, so creating a network of merchants and peers, individuals typically receive a card, but they can also receive money on their phone using either a smartphone, a WhatsApp wallet, or a USSD or SMS menu. Merchants, so these can be anybody from a boat driver to a market mama, you saw that woman in the image selling fresh food in the market, to a big grocery store. Uh, they are then able to process payments from cardholders uh, who have this tap and pay card. And that tap and pay card does not require a bank account. And that's where we're trying to create new systems for financial and economic inclusion. And this is where individuals with a card are able to transact with merchants who have this wallet. Uh, lastly, anybody who has this application can send and receive money between each other. So we've seen cases where merchants in network are restocking their goods with another merchant in the network. And again, encouraging the circulation of money within the community that is critical to rebuilding businesses and rebuilding livelihoods. Uh, and lastly, we do have this automated cash out system. Um, so we currently have cash out integrations for mobile money wallets, uh, such as those with MyCash or MoCash, as they call it in Haiti with Digicel, with Vodafone and multiple other networks. And this is where you are enabling small businesses to be able to get this money off the blockchain you know, and into the real world, acknowledging that many things still happen in cash. Uh, and the best part is having this digital command center where emerging impacts can do crypto custody management if your organization is unaware, but also where most importantly, you are able to monitor the activity across the merchant network and across the participant network in order to get real live data that is telling you how people are responding to it, how people are recovering from a disaster, but also that are providing some critical aid transparency to the general public, back to donors, so that we can begin to understand where is more support needed, where is less support needed, uh, and ultimately who is truly benefiting, maximizing and multiplying the impact of being uh, involved in these systems. And until we know this, until we know more and better how people recover post-disaster, post-receipt of, of assistance, we cannot hope to intervene in a way that builds that resilience and preparedness over time before the next disaster hits, because we all know it's a question, not of if, but a question of when. Um, so the philosophy here for us isn't talk, talk, talk about blockchain. It is how do we build blockchain applications that are truly able to change, not just recovery pathways, but that are able to change the way that we assist people pre and post disaster. Uh, and the way that we build this technology in order to include people that have historically been excluded from digital innovation. And that's where we're looking at putting the right hands, the right tools in the hands of the right people and coming back to basics. You know, the fact that people power money. Money does not empower people. People give money power by allowing it to circulate within the community. Uh, and this is where these systems, I believe, frankly, when you can digitize them, are also going to be leading to a future where 
digital and financial inclusion is going hand in hand with disaster assistance so that we are building resilience over time. Um, so I've put some web links in here. Uh, I don't know if I'm, if I'm on time and apologies for the technical issues, but, um, but that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Hart, for a very insightful presentation. And I'm sure the audience uh, would have learned quite a bit about emerging impacts and the work that you've been doing in Vanuatu and across the Caribbean, including in Haiti, with the disaster response to the 2010 earthquake. Um, I, I think this is the type of technology or the application of the technology, rather, that we do need in smaller and developing states because a lot of the larger uh, countries um, they're preoccupied more with the advancement of their societies, whereas within the smaller and developing states, we have to kind of tailor make and craft our own solutions for the uh, multitude of problems that we are facing. Um, so I'm very encouraged by the work that your organization has been doing, and I look forward to what you can also achieve uh, within the region as you partner with all the other entities within the Caribbean, including um, CBS and CIRMES as well. Now, we turn our attention to the final presenter, um, Mr. Jose Luis. And Mr. Luis is a wildlife conservationist working closely with communities, policymakers, and government agencies at a national and international level with the prime intent of ensuring participatory protection of India's natural heritage. He holds a profound interest and commitment towards diverse conservation issues and has developed expertise in conceptualizing and designing projects, capacity building, strategizing, team building, and networking to ensure long-term sustainable solutions for wildlife conservation. Uh, Mr. Louis was associated with Wildlife SOS, which is saving India's wildlife as a rescue coordinator from 2004 to 2006, and since 2007 has been affiliated with the Wildlife Trust of India as one of the key members executing multifaceted conservation projects across India. At the Wildlife Trust of India, WTI, uh, Mr. Louise is the chief of the Wildlife Crime Control Division, WCCD, and a member of WTI's executive management team with responsibility for the overall functioning of the organization. And as the chief of WCCD, Mr. Luis oversees the planning and implementation of projects across the country, this is India, in association with the state and central government officials. His dedicated team works on various aspects of countering illegal wildlife trade by training law enforcement, agency officials assisting in investigations on organized wildlife crime, providing legal assistance in trials, trial courts rather, and also in the development and implementation of information management systems to monitor wildlife crime. He is a qualified and competent techie, according to him, who launched his tech career with renowned IT companies where he managed information technology, infrastructure design, computer network design, and troubleshooting for major corporate accounts and led tech teams. His move towards a career in wildlife conservation started about 16 years ago and was a, a, entirely a personal decision which manifested upon very conscientiously, he up, manifested upon very conscientiously. And this was done to embrace the path less explored with an upbeat tenacity to work and support wildlife conservation. It would be apt to summarize his career profile as a techie who strayed into hashtag wildlife as religion and faith. I now turn over to you, Mr. Louise. You have the floor, sir. You could turn on your camera and also unmute your mic. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. I hope I'm audible. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. So thank you very much uh, for that wonderful introduction and uh, uh, Good evening or good morning or good afternoon to all the participants. I am currently joining from India. It is almost midnight here. And uh, I must admit that the previous presenters were so enlightening that I, 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 was, I was watching each slide and gathering 
uh, I was writing my own notes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Carl and uh, Sandra for uh, uh, such wonderful presentation and insights. So let me share my screen. All right, I hope my screen is visible and uh, we can talk about a bit of wildlife crime and how we use technology or how we use the possibilities of technology in fighting wildlife crime. And uh, when I when I saw the title of the, the seminar or this meetings, I literally loved it because we're talking about the invisible border because in a criminal situation, I am sorry because I, in, in my presentation, I'll be talking about crime and criminals instead of natural disaster. So it's a totally different topic. Um, in a criminal situation, we always look at borders, like borders where crime happens, whether it is wildlife crime or it is narcotics or human trafficking. It is definitely definitely the land, the sea, and the, the air. These are the, the borders you, you get, you know, people moving goods across or illegal activities happening at this border areas. And definitely the fourth border, which is the, the cyberspace, that is what is uh, becoming one of the most serious areas of concern because of the diversity, because of the, the possibilities. And in last two years, what we are watching is that the cyberspace is becoming uh, the most favored ground of uh, wildlife criminals because it is connecting um, illegal wildlife trade gangs across the world without much of a problem where they are able to connect with buyers and sellers and middlemen and they are able to use various transaction methods they are able to use social media they are able to use whatsapp like any other activity like all the social media tools are developed for human networking we were we are you know we are we are slowly or we are slowly and steadily we are entering into a borderless world using technology but the dangers are where people using uh, the same technology for um, you know illegal activities like this all right so I'll be talking a bit of uh, how we are using technology in fighting wildlife crime. Uh, as Dr. Douglas told, I head a wildlife crime control division in India with a, one of the largest not-for-profit organization, the Wildlife Trust of India. And a couple of years back, exactly about four years back, we started using technology and we started naming our technology intervention as HOC, Hostile Activity Watch Kernel. This is a, a way of looking at various kinds of hostile activity, which is related to wildlife crime happening across the country. And we named our technology under various hawk names. You can see Shikra is a, a hawk, which is found in India, a small bird of prey. Peregrine, as most of you know, it's a, it's a global uh, falcon. It is, it's one of the fastest bird and harrier. So these are three codenamed technologies which we developed. Uh, we use the first technology, Shikra, is for wildlife death monitoring. So if there is a wildlife death happening uh, in any national park or in any protected area or even outside the national park, this information, uh, the, the information regarding the wildlife death can be managed through Shikra. And Peregrine is a centralized intelligence and documentation management system where information regarding various criminal activities, criminals, uh, suspect databases, documentation, arrest details, and their criminal activity details, everything is managed through a centralized system. And finally, Harrier, the cyber spotter network, which is a citizen portal where we are using, you know, citizen initiatives to report wildlife crime and related information where information can be from cyberspace. People can report uh, illegal wildlife trade happening in, in social media like Facebook or, you know, Instagram or even using WhatsApp. Now, the interesting thing is that all the systems so over the last two years or three years are able to collect a large amount of data. I'm not getting into the AI part of it fully now, but I would like to give all of you an idea because 
I, I saw the, the group is a mixed set of people and I don't want to get into a lot into technology, but I can, I can, what I would like to do is to tell you that how, you know, how this kind of information management systems can be used for collecting information and which can actually prevent or which can actually, you know, typical enforcement language, which can actually create unfavorable operational conditions for criminal networks to, op to operate. The basic principle of all these systems, if you look at wildlife death is connected to crime. Uh, there can be, for example, there can be poaching of, of an elephant, which is happening in, in a forest. Now, how is that? The, the, the first person who reach a, 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 the crime scene, the forest guard, who will be seeing a dead animal. So he is immediately reporting that there is, I found a carcass of a dead elephant. So that information is logged into the system. And there are various information regarding that particular death is entered into the system, whether it is a male elephant or a female elephant, whether the ivory is missing or not. So that information comes into a system. And when there is a person arrested, that information is connected. That information will be connected with the death of the elephant. And the third thing is that if the product from this, the, the product from this illegal activity that the ivory is traded somewhere, and if somebody is getting to know about it, that person is reporting about it. So we, at the end of the day, we are able to connect all this information, and this will give us a lot of um, intelligence, which can actually create patterns, which can actually help us to predict. And that is where we will be using the capabilities of um, artificial intelligence to predict and develop patterns that, okay, we know that, okay, if this and this and this variables are coming together, then there can be a poaching incident or there can be a criminal activity. So it is a bit of a complicated system, but what we started a few years back is started giving results to us. I'll take you to, you know, one of the functioning of the system. For example, what kind of information you get um, about wildlife crime and where all you get information from? Um, <clears throat> Basically, the first level of information comes through routine checking, whether it is uh, the forest department people or the enforcement agencies are doing routine patrolling, uh, vehicle checking or check post. So you can get information from there. Suspect interviews, if you have a suspect who is in custody, who will be talking a lot about illegal activities, which is connected, which is not connected. Uh, we, we call each of this kind of information or packets of information which is coming. It may not be connected when you look at them individually. And you may get information from, you know, assigned informants who are professional information gathering people, they may be collecting information. Uh, historical data from FMIS, this is a terminology used, like if you have data from um, um, files which are digitized, that is a source of information. Uh, collect data from random sources, because there, there, there can be many places where you will be getting random information. Somebody came across with a small piece of information uh, from um, uh, not a regular source uh, during a conversation, somebody talked about something, so they in they input that data into the system, and uh, information received from other agencies, whether it is army, police, or border security forces. So these are places where you'll be giving getting information. Usually, now imagine a situation where you don't have any kind of uh, information management system where you can connect all this information. This information or this intelligence, I mean, I don't even call it it's an intelligence. This information will sit in various pockets, like various officers, various officers. It can be in a file, it can be you know, in somebody's notebook, it can be in somebody's mobile phone. So all this information will be very much valuable when you start collecting it together. So what we have done is that we, we started creating modules of small, small, small software. Like that was the strategy that you create a mobile application for the general public. Uh, you create a mobile application for officials where they are going for patrolling. So where they will be giving, they will be updating information about uh, you know areas of interest or people of interest. They'll be giving updates. Like if you know about a particular person who is involved in criminal activities, we try to gather information about what is he doing currently. If you have a habitual offender, if you have a, a person uh, who is involved in uh, in poaching or illegal activities. What is he currently doing? What kind of uh, lifestyle he is following? So there are various parameters. You'll be entering this data into the small mobile application, or we will say that places of, um, you know, area of interest. Like if you have a particular location that it could be a, a, a particular hideout or there, it could be a intrusion point. 
So these are the areas where you'll be collecting information from. Uh, well, we have uh, captive elephants, which are kept in captivity, which are owned by private owners. Uh, they are a big source of, uh, you know, pieces of ivory into the market. So there will be monitoring of this elephants. So there will be official officials going and collecting information about, you know, the pruning of ivory or the health of the elephant or the presence of absence of the elephant. These are valuable data points. Information coming from check, po check posts uh, and uh, uh, information coming from social media and toll free numbers, everything. So these are the tools which are used to digitize uh, information gathering, which were done, which was done in traditional manner in the past. Now we got a set of digital data, which will be, you know, uh, which will be analyzed in a system core. So, so that is where the, the these uh, data from various sources connected. It is verified, and uh, you know, it, it is it is currently it is a hybrid method. It is there are analysts who are analyzing this information, um, and patterns are developed, and machine learning is starting. Um, artificial intelligence, sorry, not machine learning, artificial intelligence capabilities are used on this, this kind of data. And what you will be getting is actionable intelligence and report. So well, currently what we use is that we use the wildlife mortality database. We use uh, call data analysis if there is a mobile call records or suspect database is used, the mobile forensics is used. So all this kind of technological thing is used at the system core, wherever we are using uh, this data as inputs. And this information, the, the, this, this data, which is, which is collected from various sources, is converted into actionable intelligence and reports. So that is what we do. <clears throat> a lot of data, a lot of information, which was previously kept in cupboards and files is currently digitized and it is processed and actionable intelligence and reports are given to enforcement officials for action so that is how we are able to use technology to fight wildlife crime very efficiently for example i'm, I'm taking you state into a dashboard of a particular state where you can see that the number of wildlife crime records are about 2775 this is this is a, a real system where information is kept and this is just a just the dashboard where you can see that how much data is collected and kept in the system and uh, so if you if i'm, I'm not um, showing you the what do you call the functional system this is just a screenshot to make it easier for everybody and uh, this data if you look at and uh, if you look into a map you will get maps like this where you can uh, cluster the data immediately you can see that which area where there is more crime where there is less crime you can click on each buttons you can ask the system various queries you can ask it ask when the when, between a particular uh, time period what what type of crime was happening what kind of species are affected by the crime what is the status of things like you know many of you may not understand all this you know <laughs> Uh, terminology but you know what is the status of you know criminal proceedings against these people whether it is at a preliminary investigation level or whether it is a level where the the investigation is completed whether they are taken to the court so this kind of information can be you know we can look into a, a map and we can see that okay what is what is happening in, in a particular region about wildlife crime and over a period of time what is the trend whether the crime is increasing or the whether the crime is decreasing now, the final product which we are working currently is that um, a, sm a, a smartphone, which has got all connect, which is completely connected with all the backend databases and which can help an enforcement official to, to do various functions, which was previously he could not be able to do. Uh, the, the mobile device is connected to wildlife death, suspect databases, crime databases, alerts, and wildlife trophy, everything in a particular region. And he can, uh, in real time, he can look at various things like if there is, um, you know, if he's on a patrolling, if he's on a site visit, he can connect to the main database. You can look at suspects. If uh, an incident happened, who are the who are the possible suspect who could be involved in this area? Or if, for example, if there is an elephant poaching happened, he will be the system will be able to tell him that you know who are the suspects who are involved in in a similar, uh, I mean, who are involved in elephant poaching in last ten years. Then he can ask the system that okay, let me know that if um, let me know how many of the suspects were involved in a poaching of an elephant where a, a, a gun was used to commit the crime. So it will it will filter the data and it will give you a set of suspects. 
and then you can ask the system that how many of the suspects are at a, at a threat level of eight out of 10, where eight or nine or 10 is like they're highly active. The system probably will give you two or three names. So this kind of an approach will, able, will, will, will help an enforcement official to immediately respond to a criminal situation. Okay, he don't need to ask around. He don't need to do a lot of investigation. You know that this could be a couple of suspects who could be involved in this kind of uh, criminal um, AM, criminal activity. Over a period of time, when you get more and more and more and more of data, and which the system will analyze and the system will start developing patterns and the system will be able to predict or the system will be able to pinpoint, um, you know, accurate. Um, I mean, in, in a criminal situation, the, the system probably will be able to filter out um, hundreds of suspects and the system will be able to tell you that, okay, these are the, the potential 10 people or potential five people who could be involved in this kind of a crime. So that is what we are trying to achieve by using, uh, you know, the capabilities of technology. Uh, so that was one thing, and the other tool which we developed is uh, um, a cyber spotter, where you know we are using um, the capabilities of citizen um, science, where you know people can give information about wildlife crime happening and how this is helping. Because as all of you know, that the internet, the social media, is becoming the most challenging ground where cyber wildlife crime is happening. I'm not getting into too much of it, but let me tell you. Uh, all these social media platforms, whether it is um, Twitter, whether it is Instagram, whether it is uh, Google, whether it is Facebook, whatever you look, all of this has got some sort of you know connection with wildlife crime or you know people who are using all any of this platform could uh, use this platform or I should say could misuse this platform to commit wildlife crime. Uh, in one of the recent investigation or one of the ongoing investigation, we are finding people are using um, you know platforms like. Uh, YouTube uh, and uh, comments in YouTube to network. I mean, they, they have specific video channels or specific YouTube YouTube channels where there is a harmless video is uh, posted and people use the comment box to connect with each other for you know selling things like pangolins. And we investigated this kind of criminal networks and we found that there is a lot of activity happening. So what is happening is that even if you put volunteers, even if you put enforcement officials to monitor these websites, it's a, it's a huge task. So they, they monitor these websites and they collect a lot of information. And um, you know, once you once you get information, they try to inform their seniors uh, using various methods. So like somebody will be sending an email, somebody will be sending an SMS, somebody will be using WhatsApp. So this information will be coming to various um, seniors and you know investigation officers, and it it, it will not help you to you know um, investigate. Uh, rather, it will it will confuse and. Uh, in, in this kind of a confusing situation, there will not be any 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 possibility of taking enforcement action because one the inf your information is not accurate, information is not time bound, information may not be able to you know may not be able to, we may not you may not be able to verify this information. So that is when we thought we will change the approach and we use the mobile technology. All this ground level investigators or what we call as the cyber supporters were given a small mobile uh, application where they can patrol uh, cyberspace, they can look at social media, they can look at um, you know, uh, social networking sites, or they can look at uh, WhatsApp, or they can look at Telegram, any of these channels where anybody is involved in, in illegal wildlife trade, they can use the mobile application. And this mobile application will connect the data into a cloud server. And in the cloud server, the system will process the data, system will filter. And also you have analysts who will be monitoring this and they will provide actionable intelligence to the enforcement agency or the, the right authority so that they can immediately take action. So this is how actually technology changed the equation. The technology is, is able to uh, you know, simplify the, the entire process. And uh, what I believe is that if, if we all believe and if we all, we all say that the illegal wildlife trade is uh, in the cyberspace, then we should be in the cyberspace. You, we should be using similar tools. We should be using digital tools to fight wildlife crime. So we are, again, we are getting results. We are gathering a lot of data and this data gathering is going to help us because we are going to store this data in, in servers, in cloud servers, and this data is getting analyzed on a regular basis. And we are understanding what is happening and what kind of trend is happening. We are able to look at patterns. We are able to look at emerging trades. We are able to look at uh, which geographical area certain trades is happening. We are able to look at trade networks, what good is moving in what direction. 
and we are in in the beginning of we are we are we are able to predict certain movements and we are able to alert people and enforcement agencies so that they can take preventive action now these are simple examples and i'm as i told i'm not getting into you know the 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 intricacies of using ai on this but what we are working is that identifying images of wildlife goods in the digital space now we are getting a large number of animals it, or animals or animal products it can be a tiger skin it can be an ivory it can be an article made of ivory or it can be a particular bird it can be a bird which is protected in one country not protected in another country uh, we are working on you know algorithms where you know images can images of wildlife goods can be detected by uh, by computer uh, by the by the capability of technology um <clears throat> uh, thousands and thousands of images are coming from you know camera traps and video surveillance across the country in, in forest areas so we should be able to uh, you know detect images of interest that if you are supposed to have no human beings in a particular forest and suddenly in one camera trap image if you find a human beings photograph uh, human beings image it's the the system should be able to identify and its system should be able to you know pull it out and say that alert us that there is um, a human image in one of the system this this technology is already developed and we are actually in the process of training our system so the system is able to detect uh, animals the, the system is able to detect human images in uh, among like hundreds of thousands of images and it is it is it is slowly learning how to detect uh, human images and uh, develop patterns and predictions models from hawk data um, if we talk about ai or machine learning the first thing what you need is a lot of data a lot of data means probably thousands probably millions of data sets that is when the system the computers the the uh, the non human brains will start understanding start learning and start developing this machine learning or artificial intelligence so the first thing is to bring a lot of data and we are trying to do that and we are trying to develop use this data to develop patterns and um, we a couple of days later we are doing a tiger thon which is on the 30th of this month we are actually bringing experts from all over the world to work on a certain technology solutions for finding solutions towards you know ending uh, tiger trade so this is one good way of uh, bringing fresh ideas uh, good expert technologists uh, people like uh, people from dell people from google people from vodafone are participating in this challenge so it is also a way of you know making the technology community aware about the conservation needs and the challenges and bringing them together to uh, develop good conservation technology and especially technology for fighting wildlife crime in the cyberspace uh, well that's all thank you very much and over to you dr douglas Thank you very much, Mr. Luis, for a very intriguing and exciting presentation. Um, the work that you and your group, the WTI in India, have been doing with wildlife crime is very cutting edge, is very exemplary. And we are hopeful that we can collaborate and also develop similar systems here in the Caribbean to combat um, illegal wildlife trade and also environmental crimes as well as we recognize that FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, which has responsibility globally for enforcing um, anti-money laundering uh, protocols within the different financial and banking sectors across the globe, have taken particular interest in illegal wildlife trade and environmental crimes, which include also the trade in lumber, uh, restricted lumber species, so not only um, living animals, but also plants and trees and um, of the botanical species as well. So that brings us to the end of the presentations. Um, in the interest of time, we will forego the round robin uh, panel discussion with the panel question, but instead we will dive into the chat and look for the answers that have been posed by our very patient audience who have stuck with us to, our, to the end. And there's a comment here from uh, Dexter. He is, he is opinion, uh, opining, um, how reliable would you say is crowdsourced material given the variability or perception of persons supplying the data? There are many instances of persons feeding past images, et cetera, when there are adverse events. Yeah, so, so thanks for the, the question, uh, Dexter, good question. 
yes, there are instances where there could be some uh, subjectivity in terms of crowdsourced data. But I think in, in, the, in my particular context, uh, I, I don't see that, you know, I think it would be based more so on observable uh, information, observable damage. And so I think that, you know, would not lend itself to as much subjectivity as perhaps uh, other, other contexts where, yes, you know, what, what is actually the case uh, may be more difficult to, to interpret. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Payne. Uh, Mr. Louise, you wanna take a... Um, yes, uh, Dr. Douglas. Um, and uh, this was um, one of the major challenges we faced because we were dealing with um, sensitive data, uh, criminal information. Uh, so one of the thing which we, uh, we have done is that when we developed a mobile app, uh, we designed the mobile app in such a way that the person who is taking a photograph has to use uh, the specially designated mobile app to take the photograph. So that will automatically detect the GPS location, date and time of the image. And uh, that will ensure that you, do, I mean, that does not have any facility to attach an image. So the image has to be taken through the mobile app so that it is embedded into the app and it is it is encrypted and it is sent to the server and uh, we 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 ran a, a, a hack on the system we actually asked the other programmers and people that can you actually manipulate the data once the photograph is taken for example um, if you are in an area where there is no network and you have taken an image and it is temporarily stored in the mobile phone can you manipulate that no it is not so we have designed it in such a way that only images taken using that particular mobile phone without any modification will be accepted into the system. Any kind of uh, tampered images is not accepted. So that is one way of um, looking at data accuracy. And uh, that will also ensure that, uh, that will also give you additional information, date, time, and location where the photograph was taken. So uh, I believe in quality data in, quality data out. Excellent answer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Louise. Um, we have another question in the chat and it's from Colleen. Um, the comment goes, very interesting use of AI. I am interested in if such methods can be leveraged to study environmental behaviors or social behaviors interfacing the natural environment. Um, Sandra, would you, because I know you're the, the social scientist amongst the, the panel, and um, I, would, I would pass this question on to you. Yeah, sure. Can you, I, it just cut in the middle of the question, if you can just. Sure, I, I can. But I, think, I think I've got the answer already, but please, okay. yeah. Okay, um, so the person is asking, Kaleem is asking, I am interested in if such methods can be leveraged to study environmental behaviors or social behaviors, interfacing the natural environment. And yeah. um, I know with the blockchain technology, um, you, you, you have a, a dashboard of all of the data and the information that you collect across the project that will then inform in terms of social behaviors and purchasing, trading, all of that nice, wonderful data. So go right ahead. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the you know the particular value of blockchain here is that you're able to pull and combine multiple data sets from multiple sources and locations in a predictive way, right? So, and this is why people say that you know blockchain is now the age of programmable money and programmable data because this means that you can triangulate what people think about their environment through something like crowdsourcing how people perceive disaster impact compared to the way that the government has assessed it, you know, and then use that data, triangulate that data to begin to understand not only how to deliver, but who to deliver to and where and how in a way that is leading to a result that is more optimal. Um, and so in the social case, one of the things that is especially in disaster assistance, but that we now see is very common with climate change, 
is that the perception of impact at the community level is often you know, misaligned with the assessment and the measurement of impact at the government level, right? Um, or at the economic level, because economic analysis tends to only see the formal economy. It does not see the shadow economy or the informal economy that we know, whether it's the Caribbean, the Pacific or Sub-Saharan Africa, the informal economy is often the majority of the economic activity that is happening in our country. So some of the, the questions and areas of work that we've been looking into with emerging impact is if we can combine these data sets to create more reliability and predictability in the delivery of assistance, and if we can generate new data sets on how assistance is being used across a network of mobile devices and people who are connected into the system, then we can start to, and you know, Dr. Carl and the work on machine learning and AI is already doing this, but we can begin to learn from the way people are interacting with the way that they are being assisted, you know, and how those perceptions are changing over time. Because at the end of the day, if you've been impacted by disaster, it is very important to understand whether you truly feel that you have recovered or not, you know, and that is core to resilience is the belief that you can recover, you know, and the relative understanding to you, your family, your household and the community around you as to whether you have actually reached that recovery point so that you can begin to think about preparing for the next disaster. So some specifics in this is, and this is where, you know, I was mentioning climate change, is that we've seen often that indigenous communities have a perception of the way that their environment is being impacted by climate change first and by disasters second, that is different from the way that urban communities and non-indigenous communities perceive this in impact. And that should mean that we are nuancing the way that we assist communities, whether it's people working in the informal sector, indigenous populations, people who are remote and marginalized together with people who are in urban areas. So when I look at things like crowdsourcing, this is again, an opportunity to start to look at how are we shifting power in the way that we are responding by acknowledging that the people's perceptions of what is happening is equally valuable to you know, the more scientific you know, perceptions or the way that we typically measure impact. Uh, the same thing goes for things like valuations of traditional land or indig indigenous land that there is a huge kind of travesty in terms of the value associated with the actual ground that people live on when you use a Western economic model, as opposed to when you use a more indigenous and communal valuation model. And so these perceptions are all associated with how do you valuate the, either the destruction that is post-disaster or the wealth that is being built during the recovery period, you know, so although maybe many people in the case of Vanuatu, the market mamas that were participating in the system were not making a lot of money by Western or economic, you know, terms. What they were doing were playing a key role in terms of these community networks that move fresh food around disaster affected areas, you know. And they also represent a network of women who are aunties and mothers and sisters that when they recover, they play a moral support role to the people around them. And again, there are psychological components to resilience that I think are associated with society, culture, and perception that we now have different ways to draw on and to give value and numbers to in a way that's quantifiable so we can elevate it to the level of where more let's say, uh, more, more rationalistic, you know, data models and data sets currently sit so that we are assigning value to people and the way they understand these changes in the environment in the same way that we've been assigning value to economy, um, you know, and more scientific measurements of data for some time. Yeah, I just wanted to, to jump in. So yeah, good insights, of course, from the anthropologists. Uh, but I think you know, 
the, the social aspect has to be at the same level, uh, given the same consideration as the technological aspect. Uh, where we've seen, you know, things gone awry recently in the news, this is very topical, is Facebook, right? And the, the uh, proliferation of misinformation and so on. So imagine a social network, you know, the emphasis should be on social, but a social network that put most of the emphasis on algorithms. So, you know, these algorithms that look at who are in your friends list. Uh, so there's lots of nice AI behind the scenes, but then by not understanding enough about this, the social aspects, I, I think, you know, it has led down to a disastrous path. And so I think uh, with blockchain and AI and machine learning, you know, applied to disaster management, climate change, the wildlife uh, management aspects, we all should bear in mind the, and are, are, are already um, putting people at the forefront of what we do. And I just should mention, you know, my colleagues from Vanuatu and India, uh, where, where we need to get in the Caribbean region and a, a lesson we could learn is how do we move from where we are in terms of, you know, having centers of excellence at the university, but taking that science and developing tools and putting the right tools in it, as, as Sandra said, in the right people's hands, right? So uh, I see, you know, Mr. Louise in India as well, they have their mobile apps, their dashboards. Can we take what the science leverage that and develop dashboards that help us to make decisions in the face of several uh, several challenges with climate change in the disaster context being uh, at the forefront of, of driving the what what where we need to where we need to go? Yeah, I think that's a that's an excellent point, um, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Douglas. If you may permit me. Sure, go ahead. Um, Dr. Kahl, I, I, I completely agree with you because, um, uh, you know, last four or five years, whichever workshop we attend, we all heard about, you know, or, or last 10 years, this was a constant thing which I used to hear in conferences, workshop, that agencies don't talk to each other or there is a gap between you know, one set of data and other set of data. And these algorithms or these theories were already there. We are not, re I mean, we are not inventing anything, anything big. As you said correctly, taking this, uh, you know, this thought process or this uh, ideas uh, from textbooks and from, you know, uh, from, uh, from theses or papers, into a practical thing in the field where you know technology can be used the biggest challenge is implementation of the technology and making it sustainable mm -hmm. having worked last five years uh, you know building these systems uh, i learned this because it is it is uh, you have to build a technology which is simple which is sustainable and which is participatory people should participate otherwise a lot of ideas come a lot of tech, come sorry but you are not able to take it forward um i like sandra's ex example like you know how technology is transforming lives so technology as it is if it is limited to our metropolitan big large cities where it it have which, which it which where it further improves or support modern life we have to take technology to the rural areas where connectivity is less, um, you know, availability of the faster, newer uh, phones are not there. So we have to build a technology which can meet both the ends, uh, the, the minimum infrastructure and utilize the possibilities of what is coming maybe after two, three years. So that is what our technology vision should be. We, in, in present, we should look at the past and we should look forward for the future. Develop technology for five years down the line, maybe the sixth G or something, but ensure that you have at least two or three years backward compatibility. So that's a big challenge. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. Yeah, thank you as well. Um, I find the conversation very insightful. It's, it's positioned where I think 
we ought to have it. And I take Dr. Payne's um, comment in terms of applying similar uh, dashboards uh, you've developed, Jose. And as you mentioned, this has come with experience. And perhaps this is an area of future research and future collaboration that we can all work together on. Um, uh, general database risk management, um, database biosecurity, um, database that will allow a lot of this data to then be analyzed and converted into actionable um, items or actionable processes so that going forward, we make the sustainable, um, sorry, small island developing states more climate resilient, more disaster resilient, and therefore um, ensure that we preserve lives and livelihoods um, right around the globe. So this goes beyond just the Caribbean, but it radiates throughout the, throughout the entire, entire globe. Well, I want to thank all of the participants again for joining us in this webinar. It has been very insightful. Thank you to also the the attendees, because you have still been with us even to this late stage. Um, I'm hoping that you really enjoyed the presentations and the discourse. Uh, I would also ask those who have just joined, that we have a poll that's still open. Um, if you would mind just filling out that poll, we would be very appreciative. It helps us to design our webinars. And this webinar is a launch of the fourth Invisible Border initiative, but they, we are also planning more parts of this initiative. So this is part one, and this has now launched this technological um, purview of biosecurity, as you would have seen in the Pest Heal um, lens of biosecurity, this particular initiative focuses on techno technology and leveraging technology to actually craft sustainable solutions. So we are definitely going to um, regroup together and we'll discuss the options that we can come up with in terms of how we can collaborate in the future um, to the benefit of all of the Caribbean um, here. So I want to thank um, all the persons from the um, site sits here at KFL who have uh, been so instrumental behind the background in terms of creating the webinar uh, polls and also um, implementing the, the links that made this particular webinar a success. I want to also thank the uh, folks over at Marcom. This is our marketing and communications for the dissemination of the information regarding the webinar uh, for all of the colleagues right across the campus, for all of our colleagues right across the Caribbean as well. And I know there are some questions that are still existing in the, in the Q&A chat, uh, one from Dexter in particular. Um, we will pass this on to the relevant panelists and hopefully they can answer it and send it over to you and uh, you can have that question addressed. Now, as it relates to the webinar, we do have, uh, we are recording this particular um, webinar and the idea would be to save the, the recording. We'll have to pass it on to our marketing and communications department so that they can edit it and add the subtitles, et cetera. And then once that has been cleaned up, we are hoping to host this on a YouTube, the UWIK YouTube channel, and where persons can um, access the full length recording um, at their leisure. So once again, I really want to thank all of you for joining to the panelists who made this a very intriguing, insightful, and exciting webinar. Thank you guys very, very much. And I bid you all a good afternoon and you guys take care.